Revival. Now, Webster's Dictionary will tell you it means restoration to life, consciousness, vigor, strength. Awakening, the act of waking from sleep, or a recognition, realization, or coming into awareness of something. Revival, awakening. Northampton, Massachusetts, 1730s. Jonathan Edwards begins to preach, followed by George Whitfield. Whitfield spoke to thousands in the open air about the concept of spiritual rebirth, while Edwards warned of sinners in the hands of an angry God. Revival swept the colonies. Countless lives began to change. Churches began to change. And history remembers this as the first great awakening. September 23rd, 1857, at lunchtime in New York City, a layman named Jeremy Lanfear kneels to pray. America was in spiritual, political, and economic decline. There was financial panic and rumors of a civil war, and so Lanfear invited thousands to a rented hall on Fulton Street to pray. Six people showed up, just six people. But those six people began to pray. Three weeks later, 40 people were praying. Within six months, 10,000 people were gathered daily for prayer. Over the next two years, over 1 million Americans out of a total population of 30 million put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This became known as the Great Prayer Revival. In the early 1970s, the cover of Life magazine featured over 80,000 young people gathering for Jesus at an event in Dallas called Explo 72. A year before, the cover of Time magazine read The Jesus Revolution because something undeniable was happening. Something unexplainable was happening. Something was sweeping young people all over America. It became known as the Jesus Movement and accounted for more baptisms in a single year than any other year in the history of the Southern Baptists. 400,000 people were baptized in one year. The First Great Awakening, the Great Prayer Revival, the Jesus Movement. What's the link? What is the common denominator? What is the first step? How do things like this happen? It's prayer. The first step is always prayer. History is clear. The record is undeniable. The blueprint is right in front of us. Every great move of God begins when His people pray. Not ordinary prayer, extraordinary prayer. Unified prayer, desperate prayer. And so it's time. It's time to pray. It's time to pray in repentance. It's time to pray for reconciliation. It's time to pray for personal renewal in our own lives. It's time to beg God for spiritual awakening in our time and in our generation right now. God can do more in a moment than we can ever do in a lifetime when his people pray. It's time to pray. There's enough power here to go out and change the world. And we pray that this will be the beginning of a spiritual awakening that will sweep the world. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord. It seems like an overly simplistic answer to the world's problems, doesn't it? And yet history would say that when people turn to God, things happen. Because the question I, that I ask, maybe you ask too, is like, how does a person get God's attention? Like, how can you actually get him to listen? Is there, is, there, is there something that needs to happen in order for that call to get through to the other side? And, of course, we've been going through the book of Jonah as a church family. If you're a guest, you're welcome today. You're kind of jumping in the middle, but it's okay because this is a one-off. Because I'm pausing. I'm just putting a pause button because something really big happened in Jonah chapter 3. And, and, and I, I tried to step into it, but I feel like, man, I, I don't think I really handled that very well. So I just want to stop and say, let's just notice what happened in Nineveh. A bunch of, of you, know, pan, you know, polytheistic, you know, violent, immoral people turned to God and God heard their prayer. The end of chapter three ends with this verse. You see it up here. God saw what they did. How they turned from their evil way. God relented of the disaster he had said they would do to them. He did not do it. And you're like, wait a second. They actually got God's attention. 
And like, is this actually a principle that, that, that is consistent in Scripture? Was this a one-off event that only happened, and it only happened once, uh, you know, 120 years later, and, you know, Assyria is destroyed, and, you know, so, but in this generation, something significant happened. And we could just gloss over it, or we could just stop and circle back and say, well, what, what does the Bible say about this type of, of possibility? And so I wanted to bring our attention to 2 Chronicles 7.14, which you maybe have heard before. Actually, um, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, uh, we'll start at verse, uh, what are we starting at, verse 12? <laughs> there we go. Solomon has built this temple in Jerusalem. They've dedicated the temple. It's been a huge party. 20,000 uh, uh, cattle sacrifice, 120,000 sheep. If you can just imagine, some of you have butchered chickens and just the grossness of that, you know, a couple of chickens, blood everywhere. Can you just imagine 120,000 sheep? Uh, just the amount of cleaning and, you know, and then, of course, all these people that are in there for the temple, uh, for, the, for the temple dedication, they said from, from the farthest reaches of the Israelite territory had gathered in. This is the apex of the Israelite historical situation. This was their highest moment. The, the temple was dedicated. Solomon is praying. Yeah, you know, God, God. And then that evening, after, after all this is over, God appears to him and says to him, this, I have heard your prayer, and I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. I mean, pre- previously it had been this like tabernacle, this temporary dwelling place I could move around where, where there was, you know, the, the temple and, you know, the tabernacle and places to sacrifice and the Holy of Holies. But now there was a permanent dwelling place. And God says, I am going to dwell there. You can worship me there. You can bring your sacrifices to me there. I will deal with your sin there. And then in a weird moment he says this in verse 13 when i shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people it's not if it's it's when i do this basically when you guys blow it when you fail when you miss the mark and i send some signs to you to get you back on track he says, there is a way for you to, to, to resume and, and to get, get my attention. This is the way. Verse 14, he says, if my people were called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, we're going to walk through this verse. Now, of course, we're not living in a theocratic monarchy right now. We don't have God as our king. We don't have a temple where we worship. We don't have a king who, who rules under the leadership of God. We, we, don't, we don't live in the same era that they lived in. But we wonder, are there principles here that would apply to us today? I don't think God, is, this is not like a for Canada, for the United States, or for Britain, but there are spiritual principles embedded in this text that are valuable for us today. Because what happened in Nineveh, is a reflection of this verse. The Ninevites responded exactly the way that God prescribed for people to respond. There's four steps. They're not sequential. It's like four pieces of a, of a puzzle together that, that, that represent what it takes to get God's attention. We're going to look at that. I'm going to give you some stories, too, that kind of illustrate that from, from modern times. But first of all, you notice that if my people who are called by name, my name humble themselves, Humility is the, the first step to getting God's attention. Uh, if you were here many weeks ago, we talked about the Pharisee and the tax collector, right? And that was an example of someone who comes to God with a prideful heart and someone who comes to God with a humble heart. And at the end of the day, it's the humble person that gets heard and the prideful person that doesn't get heard. He says, if you want to you get my attention, you need to humble yourselves. Apparently, uh, Mo- Muhammad Ali <laughs> who was not necessarily a humble man, was on a plane once, and he was, you know, he's yapping in the aisles, and, you know, standing around, you know, getting ready to fly away, and, and finally the stewardess is like, okay, everybody, get in your seats, buckle up, it's, you know, it's time to get ready for takeoff, and, you know, and, you know, Mr., you know, Muhammad Ali's up there, and he's talking, he's like, Mr. Ali, that's you too? He's like, look, man, Superman don't need no seatbelt. And the stewardess is like, Superman don't need no plane either, now sit down and buckle up, you know. <laughs> 
combo themselves. And let's be honest, the root of sin is pride. When we put ourselves in a position we shouldn't be in. When we think of ourselves higher than we, when we really should think about ourselves. And humility is acknowledging that God is greater than us. And we need him. And so you're starting on your knees in this position of, of humility and dependency on God. If, if you humble yourselves... And in Nineveh, I mean, there they are. They're putting on sackcloth and ashes. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're fasting. They're, they're, they're denying themselves food. The king gets up and he takes off his royal gown and puts some sackcloth on, sits in the ash heap, says, even put the sackcloth on the animals and let's stop eating. Don't even drink. Maybe, maybe this God will listen. It starts with humility. But then it goes to that next stage. It says, all my people who are called by name, my name humble themselves and pray. And they talk to God and approach him and, 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 see, you know, and, 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 and convert, converse with him. As you saw in the little bumper video there, all great movements of God start with prayer. I have one example here. It was 1932. About 40 Christians were meeting in a town in North China for prayer four times a day, beginning at 5 a.m. Believers were convicted of sin. Two men repented of hating each other. Love was strong and deep. Joy abounded. When revival came, more, than, more people were born again than in any previous year in North China. One missionary estimates that 3,000 people came to Christ in his town. Pastors, missionaries, and Bible women experienced a deeper Christian life than they had ever known before. A spirit of prayer was poured out on the church. People loved to pray. Many times prayer meetings lasted two or three hours. The prayers were short, fervent, and sometimes tearful. Children's prayer led to the salvation of their parents and teachers. If you humble yourselves and pray. In great spiritual movements in the history of the world. People seem to forget about all the things that bother them every day. One of the leaders in our church was like, we can't get people to serve because they don't have time. They won't have time. But when God gets in our hearts, suddenly the things we thought were important aren't that important anymore. You forget about eating. All the extracurricular stuff that we're involved in becomes an option instead of an essential. And God begins to take first place in the throne of our hearts and, and, and it changes us from the inside out. That's what revival is. You can't really program it or, or create it, but, but when it happens, God moves and, and people suddenly are, their whole lives are recalibrated in that moment and pray. You're not talking to yourself. You're not looking for your own solutions. You're focusing on God in that moment. And then he says, if they not only pray, but you seek my face. Seeking God's face is to seek his will. And the desire to determine what precisely God requires in terms of standards and life direction. Seek his face. What would God want me to do in this circumstance or situation. How many of you think that? When you're, when you're counting difficulties, like, do, do you say, okay, well, what would God want me to do in this situation? And sometimes, you know, we want to fix our problems, fix the issues, you know, get involved and do that. And, and there's times to do that. But, but God invites us to, to stop, humbly stop, pray, and then seek his face. What would, does the Bible say about this? How can I respond in a biblical way? How, how would God want me to respond in this situation? Seek his face. Marcus Aurelius said, the true worth of a man is measured by the objects he pursues. Seek my face. We put a lot of effort into a lot of things, but God says, you want to get my attention, you humble yourself, you pray, and you seek my face. Come know me. Come into my presence. Discover, discover what, what I have to say for your life. And then he says, finally, if you not only humble yourself, pray, seek my face, but you also turn from your wicked ways. In Nineveh, in Jonah chapter 3, the king gets up and says, okay, everybody, you need to call out earnestly to God. And you need to stop the violence that's in your hands. You need to quit doing that stuff. 
And we need to just seek, you know, humble and fast and pray. And hopefully, hopefully we'll get this God's attention and he will have some mercy and some grace for us in this moment. He says, if you turn from your wicked ways, we get in trouble and we call out to God, but we don't want to stop what we're doing. God, I need your help, but I'm still going to keep living and doing whatever I feel like. I'm just going to disregard your law, your will, your best for me. I'm going to choose my own best, but it's not my best. It's actually worse for me than what you would have for me. But I'm just going to keep doing my thing because my thing, my way is the right way. And God's like, if you just turn from your way and come to my way, you'll find that I can and will listen to you. Turn from your wicked Ways. I found this interesting story Rick James wrote in his book called Watch. It's this girl named Hope. And maybe some of you can relate to Hope's story. Hope was abused from the age of two till 12 until her grandfather died. And to deal with all that garbage that came with that, she turned to drinking, partying as a teenager, uh, which ended up in a, you know, a relationship with a guy that ended up in a pregnancy too early. Parents went to church, so like, hey, you guys got to need to get married, so they were forced into this marriage. She married this guy that ended up being an abusive alcoholic. Finally, at 22, she, she leaves this loser and, and moves on her own with these four kids that she has, working three jobs, trying to make ends meet, and she's like, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. Turns to Wicca and even to Satanism to fill this spiritual void in her life. She finally finds a job that pays really well, has very low hours. She's like, this is perfect. She becomes a stripper in a nightclub. She also finds out that a great way to make money at this nightclub is to sell drugs. So she starts selling drugs. And, and her life is getting better, and she's got more money, and she's moving into bigger homes and all this stuff. But then slowly she starts to, to feel the pressure of life, and then she starts taking the drugs that she's selling. And pretty soon she has this debt that she has to, to pay for her own habit, but in addition to selling. So she, start, she moves from the big house into a smaller house, into a smaller house, back into an apartment, finally dishes the kids and all friends and family, and is living in a car. In 2008, Hope made her final drug run, 1036 at night, driving through Philadelphia with a car full of drugs and money. She had the misfortune of being pulled over for making a wrong turn. For some reason, the policeman asked to search her car, and Hope went to jail on 78 counts of possession and 78 counts of intent to sell. Sitting in her jail cell with despair and hopelessness sinking in, Hope asked for a Bible. I didn't open it at first. I just placed it on the desk and stared at it for hours. My first night in jail. It was a time for lights out, and there I was, alone with my thoughts, my pain, my guilt, my shame, and a Bible. Hope wasn't just a dabbler in witchcraft one of those harmless Wiccans born too late for Woodstock. She was long and far into the world of Satan, and you can imagine the sort of war that went on in her soul. I felt the love of God, and it was unbearable. I cried out to God. I cried out for him to stop because I knew he was loving me, and I didn't want it. I didn't deserve it, but he wouldn't stop. He was relentless. When I awoke in the morning, my whole body ached like I'd physically gone through a war. All I could say were three words, Jesus loves me. I felt perfect love, perfect peace. I came out of my cell that morning and I looked at all the broken people around me and I loved them. I had never loved anybody in my whole life. On the morning of her sentencing, Hope stood before the judge. After reading her charge, the judge asked if she had anything to say on her behalf. This word for word is what Hope told the judge. Every charge you have read, sir, is true. And I'm guilty for everything and guilty of many things you haven't read, Your Honor. Your Honor, Jesus found me in my cell broken and scarred and hopeless, and he's given me a new life. I'm ready to serve this sentence and pay for my crimes. If this is where God wants me, he will use me in the next years to tell of his glorious love and power of forgiveness. And sir, I will be back to this very jail, but not as a criminal, but as a testimony for my Lord and Savior. The words were met by complete silence in the courtroom. Even the court recorder stopped her tapping. Hope's lawyer started to sob, and then the judge spoke. Miss Wallace, I've never heard anyone speak with such truth and sincerity. And if you do all that you say, you're going, you are going, then you are going to be successful. Miss Wallace, I am changing my judgment against you. Today you are a free woman. Today you'll be released. It was Good Friday 2008, and Hope walked out a free woman. She turned from her wicked ways. She encountered Jesus in a jail cell and 
he met her there. And God heard her in that moment. She embodies what we're talking about here in this verse. And so if you do these four things, which is not four separate things, but it's four things kind of together that you do at the same time, then this is what God says I will do. Then I will hear from heaven. God promises to connect that call. He says, yeah, I can hear you when you're humbly praying, seeking my face, turning from your wicked ways. Then I'm listening. You guys understand this. Right? Wives, when you ask your husband to take out the garbage, how do you know when he's heard you? Not when he says, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. You know he's heard you when what? He puts down his phone. He turns off the TV. He gets his butt off the couch, goes to the bag, ties it up, carries it out to the bin, throws it. Then you know he's heard you. God says, I'm ready to act on your behalf. As you humbly pray, seek my face, and turn from your wicked ways, then I'm listening. And not just listening like, oh, I hear you. I'm listening with an intent to act on your behalf. I'm really hearing you. You all know what it's like to sit and talk, to some, tell someone your, your problem, your issue, and know that they can't help you. It's really frustrating, right? You get on that call. Yeah, I need help fixing this bill or, you know, you know, fixing my internet at home, whatever it is. And you're talking to someone way in a different time zone, with a different native language, and they're trying to help you over here in Alberta, and they have no idea what you're talking about, and you're like, oh, they're hearing me, but they're not hearing me. That's not what we have with God. He's hearing you. I'm hearing with the intent to actually do something for you. In the 1980s, communism rampant in Germany. There's a wall separating West from East Germany, and and United States presidents come and demand that that wall get taken down. Nothing happens. Nothing happens. And then a pastor in East Germany decides, let's pray that this wall will come down. For seven years, they pray. Near the end, there's like nearly 2,000 people praying every Monday for the wall to come down. It's heading to kind of a standoff. They have this peaceful protest. (laughs) <laughs> on that night, October 9th, 1989, almost the entire town of 100,000 Leipzig citizens joined the 2,000 prayer warriors carrying candles as they led a march in their streets. The East German military was prepared for a head-on conflict with riot gear, rifles, tanks lined up on one side of the street. It must be recalled that only months before this, the Chinese government had put down a student protest in Tiananmen Square. Thus, the Germans were ready to face anything except except prayer and candles. The 2,000 prayer warriors began to offer the East German army their candles, and amazingly, the soldiers began to take them, dropping their weapons to take the lights into their hands. The next week, the general of the German army, General Henneker, resigned his post. Four weeks later, on November 9th, 1989, the Soviet authorities in charge of East Germany announced that the Berlin Wall was no longer guarded the people. They were free to leave the eastern sector if they wished. People began tearing down the wall and pouring through to meet their West German relatives. God had intervened once again, and the wall had come down by prayer offered to the Almighty God, just as the Jericho walls had fallen in an earlier time. God says, I'm going to hear you from heaven, and I'm going to hear you with an intent to respond. And sometimes we pray for long times, but we've got to not give up praying. Not only will I hear you, but he says, I will forgive your sin." God promises to release us of the obligation that sin puts on our behalf. This word forgive is used only of God in the Hebrew Bible. It, there's a different word which we describe me forgiving someone else, but, but this is the word reserved specifically for God's forgiveness of sinful people. And God says, when you do all these things, then I'm hearing and I'm forgiving. I'm doing the thing that only I can do on your behalf. If you've humbled yourself, prayed, seek my face, turn from your wicked ways, then I'm able to hear and then I'm able to forgive. And of course, Solomon's sitting you know, with, with the, the temple in the background here. This is the place where you brought your sacrifices and you, and you made God right with God. And he's like, I will forgive you. I will make atonement for your sins. I will release you of the debt and the obligation that sin puts on your account. I will forgive your sin. That word sin is the idea to miss the mark. It's literally to get off the road going in the wrong direction. 
It's like that stupid thing you have in your car, you know, that tells you to turn here, turn there, and oh, re recalibrating, you know, and that's our life. Our life is a whole series of recalibrations, right? Why? Because we get off mark with the Lord. And God says, I'll forgive you. And what does that mean? He gets us back on track, walking in his way, in his will. But when we get off track, God says, I will forgive you, and I'll bring you back on track. I will forgive your sin. And then he says, I will heal their land. And of course, the Israelites had a geographic promise, which I still think is relevant and will be experienced in the millennial kingdom. God has not given up on Israel. That's why it's such a hotbed of, of, of you know, activity has been for, for, for millennia, because it is part of his plan. And the devil knows that, so there's always stuff going on there. But he says, I will heal your land. Because what happens is when you, when you sin, when you walk off the path, then I stop sending rain. I cause your animals to get, you know, scours and have diff issues. And, and, and you, I'm, I send the locusts in to eat up your crops. So, you, so get my attention. And then you turn back to me and I'll, and I'll heal your land because this is my plan. I want you to experience my best. But when you step out of my best, I do things to get your attention to bring you back on track with me. That's revival. Getting on track with the Lord. God wants to heal the land. And I wondered, like, okay, is there any modern examples of this? And I found one in this, this ancient little book I found, which came from my home church library. They were clearing out the library. My mom grabbed a bunch of books for me, and I, it sat on my shelf for over 20 years, and I picked it up just before I started this series, and I thought, wow, so there's this lady that goes to China, and she's just, you know, it's very, you know, she, she has these simple principles of prayer that, that she would teach these Chinese believers and Chinese churches, and amazing things happened. She goes to this seminary just to have a couple weeks of rest, and she encounter, goes to this region and finds out that they've been in this period of prolonged drought. The entire province of Shang Twang, where I was now visiting, was suffering from drought. For not one drop of rain had fallen for three months, and while the province had a smaller area than the state of Missouri, its population is 28 and one half million. Every, every one, with the exception of the Christians, was propitiating the rain god. That is, they were offering paper money, food, drink, and were having great processions to do him honor. So they're, they're crying out to, to their pagan god, help us get rain. The university students were deeply concerned about conditions. They had observed the useless sacrifices of money, food, and drink in numerous processions. After two days of rest, I was surprised to be called upon Thursday afternoon and asked to hold a half-hour prayer meeting with a few students from my own church territory. When I entered the classroom... These 12 students present stood up and one of them addressed me. Miss Vaughn, you've been in our homes. You know every one of our families. You know what it will be, mean to us if the wheat crop fails. Famine, pestilence, and death. Now the whole city, with the exception of the Christians, had been praying to the rain god. We've seen him carried over the fields day by day for six weeks with the chief official and the thousands of the inhabitants of the city following him. Now at last they're giving up in despair. They've carried him outside the city walls, cast him in the field. They said to him, we leave you here to blister in the sun until you feel some pity for us and our families. We understand why there's no answer to prayers made to this or any other idol. We are sufficiently educated to know that there is no power in gods of clay. But Miss Vaughn, we too have been praying for six weeks and God has not answered us. Do you know what that's like? I think some of you know what that's like. We are face to face with this question. Is there anything in this religion of Jesus Christ or is it too just a farce? We don't know that our God is any more able or willing to answer prayer than is the clay rain God. We have seen no evidence in this case that he exists at all. Whew. Although these students were honestly doubting the love, power, and the personality of God, they had not wholly lost their faith, for they asked, why is it that your prayers and Pastor Ding's are answered and ours are not? There are three hindrances to God answering our prayers, I replied. Sins of transgression of God's law, sins of nonconformity to his will, and the sin of unbelief. Let me ask you a question. Are you willing to look to God to show you what sins you've been hindering your petitions for rain? And when he reveals them to you, are you willing to confess them? Oh, yes, they said. Then I answer, let each of us offer this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive me my sins. Send the Holy Spirit into my heart to reveal them to me. Cleanse me in the precious blood of Jesus and fill me with thy Holy Spirit. For Jesus' sake, amen. 
Our knees had scarcely touched the floor before these young men, some of them unable to finish their little prayer, were sobbing out a confession of their sins before God, sins of unforgiveness, of not trusting him, of hating fellow students, sins of not witnessing for Jesus in their own families and in the college, sins of lying, cheating, breaking rules, and profaning the Sabbath. They were praying together and asking God to send us the rain. Then we prayed together and asked God to send us the rain. These young men told their fellow students what had occurred. The next day, about 30 came to the meeting. Practically the same questions were asked. The same answers were given. Again, we had the outpouring of the Spirit in convicting power. The confessions followed, and again, we prayed for rain. On the third day, Saturday, 75 students attended our meeting, and the experience of the previous meetings were repeated. Then I was invited to lead at 8 o'clock Sunday morning a prayer meeting of the entire student body, 160 in number. Once more, we had questions and answers similar to those of the first meeting. We offered our simple prayer, and once more, conviction and confession followed. On this Sunday, a committee of students was appointed to wait upon their professors to ask that all schoolwork be suspended in order that the students might devote their time to confession and prayer. The faculty, delighted with the wonderful manifestation, manifestation of God's power, gladly suspended classes for the time and asked the community to arrange for the services they wanted. This was their daily program, 7 to 7.30, prayer for the presence of the Holy Spirit throughout the day. 10 to 12, confessions of sin and prayer for rain. 1.30 to 5 p.m., students to go in groups of three all over the city, explain to people in the streets and the stores and workshops, stalls of the marketplace, and even the residents of the city officials what was being done among the students. This was their message, which they had submitted to the faculty for approval. We have come to you to tell you that we are Christians and that at the Jesus Church, we are confessing our sins to the Heavenly Father and asking his forgiveness and praying in the name of his son, Jesus, that he will send us rain. Will you join us? You can do so in your own homes or up in the Jesus Church. This program was adhered to until Thursday night. Still, there was no rain. The sky was like brass. The earth was like a furnace and full of great cracks because of the dryness. A few more such days, and the wheat would be burned up. On this day, I was not in the meetings. The preceding evening, the the professor who was my host had asked, Miss Vaughn, how long do you intend to keep this up? Just until rain comes, I replied. But realizing that the faith of this man was becoming weak, I resolved to wait upon the Lord in prayer and fasting. About the middle of the morning, I opened my Bible to the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. My eyes went straight to the 19th verse, and my joy was unspeakable as I read that wonderful promise. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I closed the book and thanked God for answer to prayer. The next morning, we awakened to find the sky covered with black clouds and a light rain falling. The rain continued until three in the afternoon. Then suddenly, a strong wind blew the clouds away, and the sun shone brighter and hotter than ever. I was resting in my room, and when I became aware of people outside the French window, looking out, I saw the entire student body of the seminary. I soon realized that from the urgent questions that were asked that I must give a talk on faith and prayer then and there, and that's, that I did. Have we sinned so deeply that God is too angry to forgive us, they asked. Did he send us the rain this morning to show us his power? And did he stop to teach us that our sins are so great that he cannot give us the blessing we asked? No, my brothers, I answered. If we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. His love is so boundless as the ocean. His mercy and grace have no limit. There is something more that he wants us to do. And so we must wait on him until he shows us what it is. What it is. Let me suggest that instead of going to the city this afternoon, it was already well canvassed, each of us retired to his own room, and then we asked God to reveal to us what we should do next. The evening meeting, one of the students asked permission to speak and came up to the platform. I know what the will of God is in this matter, he said. We know what peace and joy we have received from confessing our sins and having them cleansed by the precious blood. This heavenly, the Heavenly Father does not wish us to keep these blessings to ourselves. I propose that tomorrow we again form groups and carry the message, not to the city, but to every one of the 26 country churches that belong to this mission. We can reach the furthest one by tomorrow night, give our message from the pulpit Sunday and return Monday. Who will volunteer? In a few minutes, more than enough had offered themselves for service. All arrangements were speedily made, and early the next morning, the 26 little bands started on their journeys. That same morning, we looked up into the sky and saw those wonderful clouds back again. And once more, a gentle rain fell. By night, when our students had reached their destination, it was falling heavily, some of the time in perfect torrents. And it continued Saturday night and Sunday, Sunday night and Monday, never a respite until Wednesday. Our students returned Monday night, their clothing drenched and their faces shining. Oh, Miss Vaughn, they said, we have never until now know what it means to sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. And the wheat crop of the entire province and the large neighboring areas was saved. 
Again, the committee waited upon the faculty of the seminary. We have for 10 days confessed our sins and prayed for rain. God has wonderfully forgiven our sins and answered our prayers. If you, our teachers, gave us magnificent presents, we would take time to thank you for them. We have come to ask you to continue the suspension of our classes for 10 days, more that we may thank the Heavenly Father for forgiving and delivering, delivering us and our families from the famine and pestilence. This, their second request, was granted. We had each morning the same half hour for prayer, for blessings throughout the day. The forenoons were spent in praise and thanksgiving. In the afternoons, the students went throughout the city with another brief message. We have come to tell you that we confessed our sins and prayed to our Heavenly Father for rain. He has graciously heard our prayer and has saved us all from destruction. We're holding praise and thanksgiving services in the Jesus Church. Will you join us? You can do so in your own homes or in the church. This message, like the first, was delivered also at the residence of every official. All the services began with the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. They consisted of hymns and praise and passages of praise from the scriptures, of prayers and praise and thanksgiving and testimonies of praise and thanksgiving for blessings received. From the first day, citizens from all walks of life flocked to the church. Women hobbled on their poor bound feet from places one or two miles in the country roundabout. Unconverted persons so crowded the church that there was scarcely any space left for the students and Christians. Overfull meetings were held in the classrooms and dormitories. On the tenth day, the chief official with his subordinates sent their retinues with their, and their retinues came to give thanks to God for his deliverance. He said, I believe yours is the true God and that you preach the true gospel. I would become a Christian tomorrow if I did not know that I would lose my place and probably my head. And that was God's answer to prayer. I, I, it's a long story, but I just want to say, God healed the land. He heard their prayer. And his name was glorified and magnified in that moment. We come to the communion table. And... This is our moment where we, we recognize the, the blood of Christ that cleanses us from our sin. As we come to communion, it's this, this a moment, an opportunity for you and me to confess and, and come clean with God as, as we prepare our own hearts for this moment. And it's a precursor to, to, you know, to the revival he wants to do in our lives and in our community. You know, I, I end here with, with two questions, you know. The two questions are, are here at the end here, the challenge. Would you personally pray for revival in your own life? God, is there a fire that you need to start in my heart? And some of you know that there were periods of your spiritual life where you felt, you felt it more than you do today. And it's not that God has left you, it's that, that you've left God. And this is to say, Lord, would you revive me? And, that, and maybe you don't have gross sins in your life. Maybe it's just you, you've just kind of got complacent. You've got, you've got into a mediocre kind of just routine with God. And, and you're like, Lord, I just, I need, and he's got more to give you. Would you personally pray for revival in your life? And this secondly is this. Would you consider praying with someone else weekly? I think things happen when people pray together. Would you find another believer in your workplace in your neighborhood, another mother that lives close to you, you have kids together. Find one other person, maybe two other people, whatever. Would you commit to praying with someone else weekly? There used to be a group of men that prayed in this community. No pastors involved. Businessmen that prayed for our community. And, um, you know, why couldn't we have that again? Find some other farmers that live near you that maybe are believers that you can get together, neighbors. Would you find someone else? Say, would you get, and it could be five minutes, it could be 10 minutes, it could be three minutes, it could be 20 minutes. I mean, I'm not saying like you have to pray for this many, but just say, let's get together, let's pray for each other, let's pray for each other personally, let's pray for our families, let's pray for our church, let's pray for our pastors, let's pray for our community, let's pray for our world. And then we can sit back and watch God do some amazing things. I could, we could strategize all sorts of things for our church, but I just want to get down to the basics here. Moving up and out a new life in Jesus Christ just starts with us coming to God and, and receiving Jesus as our Savior, but then moving forward in that relationship. And prayer is a big part of that. And so this communion moment is a chance just to recalibrate, say, Lord, I'm, I'm committed to personal revival. I, I want to connect with you. I want to grow with you. I want to move up and out a new life with you, Lord. And this is why, because Christ died for me. He paid the price for my sins. He did what, 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 only, what no one else could do. And so as we take the bread and the cup, we're just reminded of this great truth. And so if you're a believer today, I invite you to participate with me and the church family in communion. If you are here just visiting, 
checking it out. Maybe you're still exploring faith. You just sit and just kind of watch this occur. Uh, we're going to come forward to receive communion. If you don't want to come forward, you can remain where you're seated, and, and we'll have someone come and bring the tray around and serve you where you're seated. That's fine. That's not a problem. But I'm inviting you into the, take the step of prayer, the step towards, Lord, would you revive me? Would you revive our church? Would you revive our community? Would, would, you, would you just do something big here in, in Canada for, for your name's sake, right? You notice the story. Who got the glory? Not Louisa Vaughn, not the seminary. Jesus, God got the glory. That's what we want. We want his name to be lifted up. And so I'm inviting you to communion. Team, would you come up? We're going we're gonna to sing. We're going we're gonna to start. Um, I'm going to invite the people that are going to serve the communion to come up as well. If you are gluten-free, there is an option here. You can just grab that here. Otherwise, we'll have you serve the bread and the cup. You just come grab the cup, and, the, and they'll put the bread in your hand, and you can return to your seat. So we'll come up the, up the side, and then we'll go down. And uh, like I said, if you need gluten-free, just grab that here. Otherwise, Tammy and Jill will serve you over here, and Amy and Jason will serve you on this side and invite you just to um, prepare your hearts now for communion. Let's pray, and then we'll, we'll come forward. We humble ourselves, Lord before you. We pray to you. We seek your face in this moment. We confess our sins. We turn away from them. And we know that you forgive us because of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you hear, that you forgive, that you heal. And as we partake in communion this morning, we are celebrating this new life that we have in Jesus. And we are praying earnestly for revival in our own lives and revival in this church family and revival in this community. Oh God, would you visit us in a way that only you can. Do some amazing things in and through us, Lord, because of Jesus, because of what he has done for us. And it's for his glory and for your glory that we, we pray these things. And so as we partake of communion, we just pray this would be a moment of just personal renewal and connection with you as we celebrate what Christ did for us on the cross. This is the whole reason that we're here. If he hadn't died and rose again, there'd be no purpose in all this. But because of that, we have hope. We have life. And so be glorified in this moment of corporate worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just come up the sides and we'll return down the center when you're ready and we'll partake.